Welcome back dear students once again to your channel. In this session we shall be continu continuing with your Macbeth Act 1 Scene 5. But before I begin, let me remind you, if you find these videos helpful and interesting, do not forget to give me a like and subscribe to my channel. It shall keep me motivated. Alright, without further ado, let's get started. Macbeth, I have been following this Oxford School Shakespeare series and I start with Act 1, Scene 5. Act 1, Scene 5 takes place at Inverness, Macbeth's castle. Enters Lady Macbeth alone with a letter. Two things are to be noted here. First, the name Inverness. Inverness is the place where Macbeth's castle was. The name Inverness has its root, you see, in invert. That means everything is topsy-turvy. Just like the words of the witches. Fair is foul and foul is fair. So, as well as, you know, the words of Lady Macbeth. What she had said, just... Uh, she will say a little later here in this particular scene only. To alter favor ever is to fear. Alright. So the word invert in inverness itself contains the germs of the seeds of invert. Okay. Where everything will be inverted. How? Duncan would be coming here to take rest to take comfort little does he know that it is this place of comfort and rest which when is going to lose his life okay so act one scene five inverness macbeth's castle enters lady macbeth alone she's alone now reading a letter this letter has come from macbeth she reads they met me in the day of success and i have learned by the perfectest report that they have more in them than mortal knowledge. So Macbeth has written to her that the witches have met him on the day of success. Success of when Macbeth became successful against the Thane of Cawdor, MacDonald and of course the King of Norway. And he has also got to realize that by the perfectest report, that these witches know much more than normal human beings. When I burned in desire to question them further, they made themselves air into which they vanished. So when I wanted to know further from them that how am I supposed to become the king of, uh, you know, the uh, Scotland and how am I the thing of order, these witches vanished in the air. Whilst I stood wrapped in wonder of it came missives, that is messengers, from the king who all hailed me, Thane of Cawdor, by which title before these weird sisters saluted me and referred me to the coming on with time with hail king that shall be. So as soon as they vanished in the air, messengers came from King Duncan, bringing in the news that I am the new Thane of Cawdor. And that I'm going to become the king soon. This have I thought good to deliver thee. This I thought I must let you know. My dearest partner of greatness. And he calls Lady Macbeth dearest partner of greatness. This is very significant. Because we will realize that Macbeth is completely devoted to Lady Macbeth. As a true partner, he is totally devoted and dependent on Lady Macbeth and they are pretty close to each other. It is because of this that Lady uh, Macbeth has written to Lady Macbeth in greater detail of whatever has happened. So this letter is significant. Be why? Because it helps us to assess the relationship of Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. That Macbeth is totally dependent and devoted to Lady Macbeth. He informs each and every detail to Lady Macbeth. He does not keep away things from Lady Macbeth is what we get to 
No. Uh, this have I thought good to deliver thee, my dearest partner of great, uh, greatness, that thou mightest not lose the dues of rejoicing by being ignorant of what greatness is promised thee. Lay it to thy heart and farewell. So keep it to yourself and do not discuss it with the others. And the letter ends here. All right. The remaining speech is the soliloquy of Lady Macbeth. What is a soliloquy, by the way? Soliloquy is when an individual is talking to himself or herself in his mind or her mind. Okay. So what does she say? Glams thou art and porter shalt be what thou art promised. Yet do I fear thy nature. It is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Lady Macbeth knows her husband too well. She says, you are already the thane of glams. You've already become the thane of corder and you are likely to become the king. But you are too compassionate. You are, your soul is too full with the milk of human kindness. You're too kind. You're too gentle. And you're not going to resort to any unfair means to get what has been predicted to you. Thou wouldest be great art without ambition, but without the illness you attended. What thou wouldest highly, that wouldest thou holily, would not play false, and yet wouldest wrongly win. So you would not make any effort to get things for in your favor by adopting any unfair means. So this shows that Lady Macbeth knows her husband too well. Thou wouldest have great glams, that which cries, Thou must do if thou have it, and that which rather thou dost fear to do, than wishest should be undone. Hide thee hither, that I may pour my spirits in thine ear, and chastise with the valour of my tongue. All that impedes thee from the golden round which fate and metaphysical aid don't seem to have thee crowned withal. So Lady Macbeth knows that Macbeth is not going to make any effort to get things done in his favour. So what she says is, I will use the power of my tongue, the valour of my tongue. In other words, I am going to manipulate you. I am going to pour all the evil thoughts in your ears by the power of my tongue and make you ready to get the kingship. So Lady Macbeth we see already is a woman of firm will, is a woman of strong nerves. She knows what it needs to be done for her husband is too meek and gentle. At least in this case, we've not seen Macbeth meek and gentle when he was fighting for King Duncan against, uh, you know, MacDonald and Sweno and the Queen of Corda. But here Lady Macbeth knows that her husband is too full of the milk of human kindness. And thus she says she's going to use the valor of her tongue to make him firm and resolute. Enters attendant. The soliloquy ends here and an attendant enters. What is your tidings? What news do you bring? Attendant comes. The king comes here tonight. Lady Macbeth. Thou art mad to say it. Is not thy master with him? Who were to so would have informed for preparation? What? The king is coming. Macbeth did not inform me about it. Is Macbeth not with him? Attendant, so please you, it is true, our thane is coming. One of my fellows had the speed of him, who almost dead for breath had scarcely more than would make up his message. So one of the fellows, one of the messengers came ahead of them. Macbeth is definitely coming along with Duncan. Apart from that, there was a messenger who had, you know, moved ahead of them, run ahead of them to inform about their coming and he's become extensively breathless because he had to run very fast lady macbeth give him tending take care of him he brings great news and the attendant exits again begins another soliloquy of lady macbeth 
The raven himself is hoarse that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. Raven is a bird, is a black colored bird, bird of bad luck and bad sign. So Lady Macbeth compares the breathless soldier or the breathless attendant who has come in to bring the news of uh, um, the Duncan's arrival. Okay. She compares the raven to that breathless messenger and says that he has brought in great news. News of what? Fatal entrance of darkness. Fatal is associated with death. So Lady Macbeth has already made up her mind what about what is going to be done. And then comes the most famous lines. She says, Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe top full of driest cruelty. Make thick my blood, stop up the axes and passage to remorse, that no compunctions visitings of nature shake my fell purpose, nor keep pace between the effect and it. Very, very strange and sinistrous lines. She, Lady Macbeth, now invokes the spirits of darkness. Previously, we've seen Macbething invoking the spirits of darkness. Now it is Lady Macbeth invoking the spirits of darkness. And what does she say? Unsex me. Take away the sex from me. That is, by sex here, we mean gender. So, by gender, she's a woman. And a woman is supposed to be very tender, very caring, very loving and motherly. So she's calling the spirits of darkness to come down and take away her womanly feelings from her. And fill her from the crown to the top, top full of direless cruelty and instead fill her with lot of cruelty. Make thick my blood, stop up the axis and passage to remorse that no compunctions visitings of nature shake my fell purpose nor keep peace between the effect of it. So, stop up the axis of the um, passage of blood from me so that no feelings of pity reach my heart. In other words, make me heartless, make me cruel. Come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall. You murdering ministers, wherever in your sightless substances you wait on nature's mischief. Nature's mischief. So she says, she's invoking the spirits of darkness. She says, come and take away the milk from my breasts. A woman's breast contains milk. And that milk is supposed to provide you with nourishment, nutrition for growth. But instead, she's asking the spirits of darkness to come down and take away the milk for gall. Gall is poison. So we see to what lens Lady Macbeth is going for her husband. Come thick night and fall thee in the dunnest smoke of hell, that my keen knife see not the wounded mates, nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry, hold on, hold on. So she's calling on the dark and sinister spirits to come down. Why? So that it becomes so dark all around that nothing could be seen. Not even the knife which she's carrying in her hand, which she which she's going to use to put in Duncan's chest and rip him apart to murder him. She has become that sinistrous. At this point of time, Macbeth enters. Great glams, worthy Codder, greater than both by all the hell hereafter. Thy letters have transported me beyond this ignorant present. And I feel now the future in the instant. Lady Macbeth is extremely overwhelmed and overjoyed to see Macbeth back. And she says, your letters have transported me. Your letters have moved me beyond imagination. And I could feel that in any moment you are going to become the king. Macbeth says, my dearest love, 
Duncan comes here tonight. Tonight Duncan is coming. Lady Macbeth says, and when goes hence? Tomorrow, as he purposes, tomorrow, the next day. Lady Macbeth, oh, never shall sun that morrow see. So Lady Macbeth has already made up her mind. She's not going to let Duncan see the next morning. So, whatever has to be done, she will do it right in this night only. Your face, my thing, is as a book where men may read strange matters. To beguile the time, look like the time, bear welcome in your eye, your hand, your tongue. Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent underneath it. So, Lady Macbeth warns Macbeth, my dear, your face should not reveal what's going on in your hand, what's going on in your heart. Nobody should be able to look at your face and understand what's going on in your mind. So, what do you need to do? You're supposed to look like the innocent flower, but be the snake underneath it. Remember, this is what Duncan had said in Act 1, Scene 4, line numbers 11 onwards. There is no art to find constructions in the face. There is no art to find the mind's construction in the face. In no way can you tell what's going on in a person's mind by seeing his face. Incidentally, Lady Macbeth is speaking on those very lines. Lady Macbeth goes on to say, He that is coming must be provided for, and you shall put this night's great business into my dispatch, which shall to all our nights and days to come give solely sovereign sway and masterdom. So, Lady Macbeth instructs, when Duncan is coming, he should be provided for, and whatever needs to be done at night, you leave everything to me. Because if you are leaving everything to me, then in the future, we are going to become the complete authority, complete rulers. So Lady Macbeth has made up her mind of what needs to be done. Macbeth says, we will speak further. It's not advisable to speak so openly about it now. We'll talk later. Lady Macbeth, only look up clear. One thing only, look up fresh. To alter favour ever is to fear. Leave all the rest to be. That is, fear always shows on the face. You just need to hide your fears. This is interesting because the witches had said, fair is foul and foul is fair. And Lady Macbeth tells here, to alter favour ever is to fear. So we see some sort of a connection being made between Macbeth and the witches. Because Macbeth has also said, so fair and foul a day I have not seen. And here again, Lady Macbeth is echoing the words, to alter favour ever is to fear. This is the first scene where we meet Lady Macbeth. And see, right at the beginning, we see Lady Macbeth as a bold, resolute, firm, strong-willed woman who does not hesitate to walk that extra mile for her husband. Contrary to which we have seen Macbeth as a shaky individual in the initial pages of the play. And then we have gone on to see how he is contemplating on things and becoming bold and resolute. But Lady Macbeth right from the beginning is extremely resolute and iron-willed. She is not going to hesitate to unsex herself and bring to her woman's breast gall for milk. Okay, and she is extremely aware of her husband's shortcomings. She knows that her husband is too full with the milk of human kindness. And that is why she wishes that the knight's dispatch, that is murder of Duncan, must be left into her own hands. Alright, so we stop here with Act 1, Scene 6. We will begin in the next class. Alright, till then, take very good care of your health and goodbye. Also, do not forget to give me a like and subscribe to my channel if you find this video really, really interesting. See you in the next video. Take very good care of your health.